tragedy for Liver King, for Liver King for me, is that the message was good and the steroid thing kind of f***ed everything up. Do you think that Big Pharma is like purposely wanting people to be unhealthy? The doctor was like, this is one of the worst bloods I've ever seen in my life. Like, I don't even know how you're functioning at the level that you do. What causes heart attacks? And he's a doctor and he said, we don't know. Sorry, hurry, sorry, everyone. Here we go. What is this? I, I always see this drink. What is this? What is this that you drink all the time? Mm. Yeah, this is uh, my favorite water. It's called liquid death. A, it, a lot of people think it's like a beer or like a tall boy sort of drink, but it's actually just mountain water from a spring mm. in an ice cold can. Okay. And I love it. It's so good. Why? It's so good. So what the name though? What's the name? Liquid death. Uh, they're, they're trying to bring like death to recycled plastic water bottles I see. to be able to recycle these fully metal cans. But I like it because once it's in your refrigerator, it's like extra cold and the water is utterly smooth. Shout out to Liquid Death. I actually have been drinking this stuff for a long time. And I, I really truly do, 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 do. Dude. I do, do love yeah. this stuff. <laughs> um, this is real spring water from a natural source, not purified tap water like other brands. So it's like a little thermos where like the the can gets cold and it just stays cold the whole day. Yeah, and I've been I've been drinking uh, basically a case a day upcoming for the fight, uh, staying super super hydrated. Like I said, the coldness it just looks good. Tell me that doesn't look good. Well, I might have to get a case because I've been doing a lot of research and I know microplastics is a big problem. Mm -hmm. So I avoid microplastics here. It's not as expensive as these glass bottles. If that you're I drinking plastic water bottles, you're basically consuming a credit card of plastic per week. That's, that's a good. fact. And they, and they also have sodas and low sugar iced teas, which are also phenomenal sparkling water. The whole nine yards. I love some iced Great tea. comp. Great comp. And it is cold. Like my, my water bottles don't stay cold like this. You all at home can get free shipping of Liquid Death's Mountain Water, flavored sparkling waters, and iced tea eight packs with Amazon Prime, or grab them from your favorite local retailer, 7-Eleven, Target, Walmart, it's everywhere, Whole Foods, Instacart, the whole nine yards, like I said, and you can go to liquiddeath.com backslash Jake to check out all their healthy, infinitely recyclable, recyclable, Recyclable beverages and find your closest retailer. That's liquiddeath.com backslash Jake. Go now. Pick up some amazing water. It's essential. It's cold. It's fresh. Shout out to Liquid Death. Murder your thirst. So aggressive with the with the labeling here. Liquid Death, murder your thirst. I feel like uh Are you just your supplements? Yeah, yeah. I got some here too for you guys. What do you think? I feel like that's a good place to start. Are we already rolling? Can you taste any? Can you taste liver? Nah, it's good. It's good, right? Yeah, I think I'm gonna eat these while we, while we do the show. That's what's up, bro. I'm hungry. It's good. Just, wow. I need it. It's good quality food. I was a little nervous going into it. I heard liver and whatever else. But I don't taste it. It's great. It's good. You can't even taste it. It's good for you. They're air dried, so they taste a little different. It's kind of like biltong. They used to do this exact like African thing called biltong. Yeah, have you been to South Africa? No, but I want to go. Yeah, it's great. It's very popular out there. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, nobody knows what biltong here is. We just <laughs> call them meat sticks. I just learned what that was, funny enough, watching a video on TikTok. Yeah. You lived in Cape Town, right? For a bit. Yeah, I, was, I used to go there often. Yeah, I'm, I was ready, I was about to run it, but, I, but then I took a bike. <laughs> it's good. It's not Jack Link's. It's, it's different. It's than, different. Than other jerky or yep. anything I've it had. It tastes better for me, though. Yeah. So I'll, I'll kind of dive in here. And uh, set the stage. Today we have on, I guess, Paul Saladino. Doctor. Doc, sorry, fuck. I'm already messing things up. It's been a long day. Dr. Paul Saladino. And uh, this is obviously like a pop culture podcast, so we don't typically have on like guests who are outside the norm. But my personal mission is to grow the podcast into something that is like very informative because people know me as like a pop culture person and like he he ha ha talk shit but the real reason i want to use my platform for good all the time and just help people and share i guess what things that have helped me with the audience as well um and so paul 
I guess you would, they call them the carnivore MD. You've done the carnivore diet, uh, lots of things around food. I, I fo- found you on TikTok at first and was doing a lot of stuff that you were like recommending, et cetera. Um, but as like a high functioning, high performing person, food, diet, that whole nine yards has changed my life as well as Liver King, who I know you're friends with. And so today's podcast is going to be not the pop culture shit, but I, I, Trust me, if you guys listen to this whole entire thing, I feel like you'll take away some very great things from it to change in your regimen, your diet, your health, uh, to help you live longer, be better, think faster, all the all the things necessary in life. One thing I would just add to that is approach this episode with an open mind. You're going to hear a lot of things that are probably so radically different than anything you've grown up hearing and that you're, you're used to. So just approach everything with an open mind. And uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff that you talk about might seem crazy at first, but it turns out to be pretty damn spot on. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of stuff might might surprise people, but it's just interesting to me. I mean, I'm I'm more of a nerd than anything else. You know, I, I grew up in medicine. My family is doctors. And I was just always curious when I was growing up, like what the heck is causing problems? I remember asking my dad, what causes heart attacks? And he's a doctor and he said, we don't know. And even as like a 12 year old, I thought that's so unacceptable. <laughs> that is mm-hmm. bullshit. Like, how can you not know what causes heart attacks? You're a doctor. And so I think I've just always been curious and wanted to understand like what is causing things mostly for myself, but then for other people. So that just like, how do we, how do we navigate this world? How do you live and what do you eat to feel your best for like sex drive, how you look, how you feel, mental performance. It's everything. It's such a, what an important input into who we are is what we eat. And I think that we, that's just interesting to me how to optimize it. Yeah. A lot, we're just lied to about so many things with just like health, food, diet, uh, all, all the grocery store, like I'm, I'm a victim, I guess, of that whole entire world where I just grew up eating fucking cereal for breakfast, start the day with a bagel and cream cheese, like pop tarts. Are you f- toaster strudel? Are you fucking kidding Bro, me? Every morning walking to school, there's a corner store in every corner. I live in the hood. There's a corner store everywhere. I get chips and a soda every morning out of school. Every every corner there's a, a a Taco Bell, a Carl's Jr., a McDonald's, this that, and that's all I'm eating, and it's all I know. I'm thinking I'm just taking care of myself. I'm eating, hell no. It was the worst thing I could have ever done for myself. I think that it's interesting because it's, it's like, how did you feel when you were eating that? Sometimes when we're really young, we don't even notice it as much. But yeah. I think that even in our 20s, you, I'm, I mean I'm in my 40s, right? But even in our 20s, people start to feel the effects of these foods. But I think some people feel it more than others, and such a huge difference when you improve the quality of the food. It's not like sexy or exciting or cool to eat things that are not junk food, but man, it can change the way you feel. No, that's the biggest thing is I would feel such a lack of energy and like, but I didn't know that. I didn't know it was because of my diet. I just thought that was normal. Yes. I, just, I just was a kid. Like I didn't, I'm just like, this is what everyone's reality is. And so I'd literally be, you know, eat the sugar blast fucking pop tarts in the morning and then by 10 o'clock, I'm ready to fall asleep on my desk. Irritability, attention problems. Uh, I mean, some kids have autoimmune issues. I had eczema as a kid, so like itchy rash. Uh, I mean, I, that's such an important point that we don't even understand how good we could feel. And so many of these ways that feel, we feel bad are accepted as normal in our society because all of our friends feel the same way. And that that's what kind of frustrates me because there's so much more potential. Yeah. And, and yeah just being in ohio it's like my dad didn't know either because he would get us fucking pizza and milk like we would literally be eating pizza milk and ranch and jojo fries deep like fried <laughs> deep fried <laughs> shit every single night um but but you don't know any better and then, and then it's like what is the solution i think we're gonna get into all of those things and i think you had a similar yeah, so, so I, I, I've i struggled with autoimmune conditions my whole life. And as we know, autoimmune conditions that are an all-time high. Every Everybody has somebody or multiple people in their family with autoimmune conditions. And I had psoriasis head to toe covered um, since I was about seven years old. And I just always assumed that that was something that I was stuck with and I was born with. And that was that um, until actually I came across your, your content and you and what you've been preaching about has really, really helped me a lot. And it, it changed a lot for me. It was the first thing I ever saw besides medical intervention, like pharmaceuticals that had an actual effect on my autoimmune condition. And that was really interesting to see other people's testimonies as well, where I've, n- I've never seen 
so many people with autoimmune conditions writing testimonies online saying this this changed everything for me, changed my whole life. And this is so cool. Thank you for sharing that because there's a real difference here in what what we're experiencing as humans with like social media. We it's it's double edged sword, right? It, causes attention issues and it, there's a lot of negativity on social media, but it allows us to share ideas and people can come together and share their experiences in a way that we never could 20 years yeah. ago, right? When I was a kid, nobody knew about this, but now there's these platforms and, and hopefully what I do helps people and people can go on the social media, learn from what I say or discard it if they don't find it valuable, but people do share their experiences because if you go to a doctor with your psoriasis, what kind of advice did you get growing up? Did, did a single doctor ever tell you that it could have been what you were eating? Yeah, never. It was, I mean, I Not remember one. the first thing I, I was prescribed was ointment. It was, it was uh, actually, uh, what is the ointment? It's uh, and, uh, it may be antibiotic ointment or is it a- uh, Sometimes they give antibiotic ointment. Sometimes they give uh, steroid ointment. Steroid ointment, there, there it is, sorry. Yeah, 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 was, yeah. The doctors that I've worked with over my years, they're, they're all smart people who are well-intentioned, but we're never taught in medical school, right? To question things. So I went to medical school really like one and a half times. Before medical school, I was a physician assistant in cardiology, which is kind of like halfway between a nurse and a doctor. And then I went back to medical school at the University of Arizona. And so I went to medical school once and PA school, another time in medical school, then residency. And man, the doctors I worked with are so cool. They're great, they're intelligent people, but we're just never taught to think like, what is causing this? And to not stop asking until you get the answer to that because you have a solution that's handed to you all the time, immediately in medicine. And here's a drug. Here's a drug. And so what you learn in medical school, medical school is this complicated decision tree of how to diagnose something. Oh, we're gonna look at the rash on your arms. It looks like this, it has plaques, it's scaling, it's psoriasis. Okay, great. In medicine, we're taught to kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, we know what it is. And then as soon as you know what it is, you know what pharmaceutical to prescribe for it. Mm -hmm. That I think is a fault of the system rather than doctors. We're just not challenged to think curiously about what's causing it. But I like what you said, Jake, and that this is interesting. You said the futuristic. It's actually not futuristic. It's the opposite of futuristic. It's ancestral, it's, right? Yeah, it's just, it's so, the solution is so basic and something that humans have just forgotten. It's not even futuristic at all. It's not yeah. even complicated. Yeah, that's that's crazy to think about. But I guess, I guess the futuristic side of it that I was referring to as well, it was like peptides oh, and yeah. stem cells and red light therapy, hyperbaric, like all of these things that can help fix a ton of problems that people just like aren't tuned in on PM, PEMP machines, like all of these things. Cause my story, interestingly enough, um, was I was professional boxer. I had just beaten Ben Askren, I believe, or, or no, I just beat Nate Robinson and I was going about my life and I knew something was wrong with me. I was like performing good, all of these things. I could show up at these practices and run fast and do all the things. But I was like, something's wrong with me. Like I have anxiety, da, da, da. I go to a doctor and it turns out like low testosterone, high estrogen, pre-diabetic, livers fucked up, brain uh peptides like or the blood brain barriers like impaired like the list goes on, high cholesterol like completely fucked up the doctor was like this is one of the worst bloods i've ever seen in my life like i don't even know how you're functioning at the level what that you, you do eating? no and that that's i mean i was i started to eat you know better in terms of boxing but i think my life of not knowing any of these things, you know, grounding, getting sun every single day, like all, all the proper diets, intermittent fasting, whatever the fuck, I, I didn't know about any of these things and my diet was terrible. And when I started getting into all of this stuff, like biohacking and eating the right way, and I followed, that's when I, around the time when I like found Liver King and that sort of shit like really changed my fucking life. Like damn near, I still have anxiety, but it's like almost gone because of all of these things. I think the anxiety is like a neurochemical thing, but. Absolutely, it's connected with your gut probably. Yeah, so I had leaky gut as well. So yep. I had everything you yeah, could possibly yeah. have, I had that. <laughs> and you know what's interesting, Liver King, I'm good friends with Brian. Uh, I just think of him as Brian because I knew him before Liver King. He gets such a bad rap and the steroid thing was, bad and he lied to me about it he lied to a lot of people about it but what people don't understand is it like he lives that stuff 100 yeah you probably have you ever been to his house i don't know if you have it's like 
because I was friends with him years before he did that stuff and he was living that stuff and we kind of connected on that and we became good friends. And I don't do everything exactly like he does, but man, the underlying message, the tragedy for Liver King, with Liver King for me, is that the message was good. Yeah. Mm. And I think a lot of people dismiss it because number one, he's still a little bit too crazy for me these days with his content and the steroid thing kind of fucked everything yeah, so, up. So the nine, I was heartbroken when that steroid thing happened because I knew how powerful and important his messages were for the world. And now everyone just writes it off. They write so off. it's, it's, it's so sad. It's super it's sad. Because a lot of his nine ancestral tenets are amazing. And it's like a lot of the things that you could follow from what he said, like, cause I started eating raw liver. I started doing everything. And so it truly, truly helped me. And then when that happened, I was like, fuck dude. Like, cause the world needs these things and now they're just going to get rid of it and not care about it. They'll dismiss it without considering it anymore. And yeah. I think that, I think that at his core, Brian is a human like the rest of us and has demons and has wounds. And he just needed that sort of social media attention or needed to like take the steroids to look big for, for his history. But what's weird is that he admitted to taking steroids when he didn't take steroids. This is like a weird thing. Like that if you like break down the layers of it is he was like on growth hormone. I think he was taking, I think he was taking Winstrol too. I think he was taking some androgens. Got it. Okay. Yeah, for I didn't sure. know that. For sure. He was taking some androgens. And I mean, I talked to him before this podcast and I was like, I'm going on with Jake. Is it all right if I talk about this? And he was like, yeah, of course. But I just think that like the things he's talking about are, are similar to the things I talk about. And it kind of bummed me out too, because this idea, and it sounds so corny, like returning to the past, like we don't have to call it any of that stuff, but just like, it's not hard to be healthy as a human. You have to kind of just see through the bullshit and see through the things that we're told, uh, you know, cut through the bullshit and just eat simple foods, you'll get so much healthier. And I think that this is the kind of stuff that I'm always trying to think about with my content. Like how can I create a piece of content, either it's YouTube or short form that like gives people value and helps them understand this concept. Of like what can they actually do? It's not that hard. Yeah. So, so I guess that I feel like that's a good segue to dive deeper into like now actionables. Yeah, so yeah. like, for the people watching, like, what is the carnivore diet? Well, I guess we could start there. And then yeah. some of the other interesting things you do about, like, showering and all this stuff. But, <laughs> but These are incredible, by the way. Oh, they're good, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, these are good. I'm trying to, I, like, want to eat more, but I'm just, like, uh, just, well, just I'm over eating here to eat in the mic. I'm learning. <laughs> so, yeah. So Don't mind me. Is that where you want yeah, to that's take what I was, Yeah, I was going to say top, top to bottom. Yeah. Lifestyle to diet. What is, for reference for viewers at home, what is your prescription? Okay, um, so I think high level, 15,000 feet, eat the fewest amount of processed foods possible, just eat unprocessed meat and plant foods. That's the first step. And that can be basically chicken, it can be fish, it can be beef, it can be pork, don't complicate it. Obviously there's levels to all of it, right? And you can get better with your meats, eat eggs, and then eat, eat whatever unprocessed or minimally processed plants that you wanna eat. You know, if you want to eat vegetables, great. We can talk about why I'm not a huge fan of those for some people. Eat vegetables, eat fruit, just eat unprocessed, minimally processed plant and animal foods and you will be, you'll do so much better. That's like super high level. And then we can go deeper. Yeah, so I guess maybe starting on vegetables, they in the wild, I guess from my understanding, grow and have these like natural protein, chemicals that, to defend people from eating them. Maybe you can elaborate. <laughs> that's the that's the, my bro it's true, math. It's true, it's good. Your bro math is good. So like you think about a plant, right? You know, we're in Miami. You can just think about plants that are outside. They have a, a, a stalk, they have leaves, and they have roots. And a lot of plants make fruit. Any part of the plant that's not the fruit is technically what we consider a vegetable. Vegetable's not really a technical term, but vegetables, you go to the grocery store and you Say, where are the vegetables? They're gonna point you to an aisle that's gonna have like lettuce and spinach and leafy greens. Maybe you'll see some sweet potatoes over there, some cabbage. So you'll see basically leaves and stems, some roots of plants. That's what we think of as vegetables. And then the fruit is different, right? The fruit on a mango tree, for instance, you know, you got the leaves and the stems and the bark, and then there's these things that kind of hang off that get colorful when they're ripe. So the plants will signal to insects, to animals, to humans, or our primate history, uh, that these things are ripe and they're sweet and you should eat them. So the plant wants you to eat the fruit, doesn't really want you to eat the leaves and the stems. And so 
I'll say from the outset that I think that a lot of people can eat vegetables just fine and have no problems. And I think that when you cook vegetables, you, you denature some of the defense chemicals, but plants are smart and plants and humans specifically, or plants and animals over a much longer time frame have had this kind of chemical warfare where plants will make <clears throat> defense chemicals in the leaves or the roots or the stems that say, hey, don't eat me, or if you eat too much of me, you're gonna get sick. I mean, there were all sorts of plants that we've encountered throughout our lives. Your parents were like, don't let him go near that plant as a toddler, because if he eats that poinsettia at Christmas or you know, like a juniper, there are all sorts of things that are frankly toxic for humans. You think about any of the plants around here, if you start eating leaves, you're gonna get sick and puke, right? So there are defense chemicals, these exist, there's no question about that. The question is how sensitive any individual human is to these defense chemicals. I think for most people, vegetables are a much better option than junk food. So I just wanna make that very clear from the beginning, but the story of my carnivore history and where I've gotten to now is interesting because kind of like your history, I found out for me that a lot of these vegetables probably triggered my immune system. And maybe I have a more sensitive immune system than most people, maybe you do too. I yeah. think that for those of us, cause I have eczema, it's a similar skin condition that's autoimmune. Mine is paired with like asthma and allergies. But I found that a lot of foods that we traditionally think of as healthy, that some other people can probably eat as part of a healthy diet, trigger my autoimmune condition. So that's really interesting. And that's kind of the beginning of the carnivore journey is me being in my residency after medical school, because you know medical school is incredibly long. It's four years of medical school, four years of residency, and being so fed up with my eczema that I was like, I just gotta do something intense to see what's causing this. And that was where I started carnivore. And you being in medical school, was there maybe a bit of frustration when you started doing your own research separately and then realizing maybe like what, yeah. what, what were the academics leading you towards and then what was you and your own research leading you towards? So nutritional research in medicine is kind of tough. There's not a lot of it that's been done. There's any, any question you want to answer in medicine that it's a nutritional question. If you go deep into the research, you'll almost inevitably be frustrated, but we do what we can with what we've got. The problem is that over 75%, probably 80% of medical research is funded by pharmaceutical companies. Mm. And pharmaceutical companies are a business. We live in a capitalistic society. Great, that's okay. They're allowed to do that, but their incentive is profit. Mm. And they're trying to develop drugs, Ozempic, whatever drug, you know, Viagra, that make them billions of dollars. And that's their, that's, their, that's their mission. That's what their stockholders want them to do. So you go to medical school, you learn drugs. Yeah. You don't learn, you might learn about gluten with celiac disease, but that's about the edge of the nutrition. So what's, what was interesting for me is I was learning about this stuff was, just hearing all the stories and thinking there's something else here that Western medicine is missing. Because when you have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people saying, hey, I had Crohn's colitis, I had ulcerative colitis, I had IBS, I had reflux, I had rheumatoid arthritis, I had autoimmune thyroid conditions, I had psoriasis, I had eczema, I had acne, I had depression, I had anxiety, right? And I changed my diet and it got better. You gotta think, okay, there's more here. And that was hard for me in my medical training because I would ask the residents that I was working with as a medical student or the supervising physicians, what's causing this? Do you think diet could have any, any, any impact? And they just, they just kind of laugh most of the time, even for gut things. So like the GI stuff I think is the most obvious, right? You're putting food into your mouth, goes into your stomach and then your intestines. Do you think it's possible that food could be causing inflammation in the intestines or triggering irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? Yeah, it seems possible, but I would say 95% of gastroenterologists, gut doctors, just kind of dismiss it. It's crazy. Do you, do you think that big pharma is like purposely wanting people to be unhealthy so that they then have this recurring subscription for people to come to them and buy medicine? Because it seems like if they started peptides and intermittent fasting and eating properly, then there are so many things, so many diseases, so many autoimmune things, cancers, all of that would go away and then they wouldn't have money. It would be really bad for their bottom line. <laughs> and you know, I, I think that you hear just, I have no direct evidence of this, but there's hearsay. You hear about these conversations in back rooms that are kind of like that, yeah. whether it's in a hospital system or at a pharmaceutical company where they kind of say like, if, if people get better from this, it's gonna be bad for our bottom line. So who knows? I don't think that, I mean, I, I wanna believe that there are actual humans with empathy, 
uh, you know, connected. Yeah, I, 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 I completely think it's happening but for I think, sure. But I think and even is. just like what the, what the FDA does. Oh, yeah. And what's happening with peptides? I mean, just that, the that, way they're that, banning peptides. Yeah, this is, or it's this already is, banned, right? I don't know. This is crazy. This is just it's absurd, this is real bro. evidence that like they're just seeing it, their bottom line go away. It's and absurd. I think, I think it's, it's sad. I think it's probably... And just so everybody knows, I'm not suicidal. If I get knocked off, like... Yeah, same. <laughs> it's pharma, same. maybe, you know? Uh, like, I, I love my life. I'm not trying to leave it, you guys. But I, I think it's probably... Oh, no. In my most conspiratorial moments, which I try to avoid, I think it's probably some sort of collusion between big food and big pharma. And so I was talking to a friend the other day, and she made this great analogy, and I thought, this makes so much sense. Like, your dinner plate or your breakfast plate, like, that's really the real estate of... That's what these people care about. And so... There's a lot of competition for what goes on your plate. And I think that there's a lot of competing ideas in the space that are probably fueled by pharma and sort of the flames of these are fanned by processed food, big food companies to confuse you into thinking that, I mean, did you see this recent campaign from Kellogg's that cornflakes are a good, are a good dinner food? <laughs> it's like the CEO of Kellogg's got a lot of heat. Now, Kellogg's is trying to tell you to eat cornflakes for, for dinner because everything else is getting too expensive. So you should eat cornflakes for dinner. That's just absurd. And I think it's just they're competing. They just want to be what you're eating. So we're going back to the empathy and like evil thing of these people operating. I don't think in those positions, a lot of people are thinking of themselves every day. So if I'm CEO, I have to meet quotas, numbers, and report to the shareholders. The shareholders don't know how it's going to happen, but the CEO has to make and do things to boost the company you're trying because, to get us killed brother no because <laughs> because because they're looking at their kids every day and their wife and they see their house and they need to make sure their family is good and then their so kid I think, is diabetic i think uh, yes and and that's where they don't know maybe we're like the wrong yeah i don't think i'm not saying it's any of their faults but i could see I'm just seeing where they come from because I don't think there's like evil humans running around, but they're like, mm. damn, I'm yeah, in it. No. I'm in, there are, there are, there, there sure are. But I don't think that's like, pe the, I will say like the majority of the population thinks that like there's so much fucking evil and X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure, of course there is in a lot of areas, but I'm saying like, just break it down a little bit f farther that like this person doesn't want to get fired lose their job be it's a compounding it's a compounding thing exactly right? they don't want to be like that. oh i didn't do good enough i didn't meet my quotas honey i got fired i don't know what i'm gonna do now my kids have i gotta take care of it, it comes back to like a lot of these things that it's not it's not just yeah, they're but, evil but, but greed is greed greed is a step beyond i got to take care of my kids a lot of the people were referring to a lot of the corporations were referring to our multi-billion dollar corporations that it, it's not it's not i have to take care of my kids it's, it's purely greed and it's control it's abuse it's power yeah yeah, yeah no and i and i and i agree it's not to say I, i'm not sitting here saying i don't agree i just try to like empathize a uh, yeah, little bit with I, I like think, i think a lot i mean because I, because i ask myself why is this happening because it doesn't why would so, do you, do we really think it's like one person at a corporation who's like i want everyone to have be have diabetes yeah it's tough it's tough Terminal. i think it's and you see it in the medical system so this is the hardest part for me i think that i don't believe that there's like one controlling person like you said who's like trying to make everybody diabetic but i think that when we prioritize money, which is okay. You know, I own businesses. I created businesses that I want to try to do good in the world with, but I don't think there's anything wrong with capitalism. But when we prioritize money and pharmaceuticals are not fully regulated and this government, you know, they have a lot of lobbyists and big food, you know, agribusiness companies have a lot of lobbyists in Congress. Things get a little lenient and things go sideways. So I think that if, if anyone watching this or any American or anyone in the world watching this believes that the U S government is looking out for your health, mm. like that's probably not happening. Well, no, no. And I, I met, I met with RFK yeah, yeah. who's running for presidency. And we, we had a great conversation about many points, but he said to me, the first thing that he would do on the first day of being in office would uh, be going down to the national health Associate institution and NIH. NIH, national yeah, Institute and, yeah, health. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, basically like tear them to fucking shreds and like mandate certain things and like just put certain laws around what these companies can and can't do this i think would be a, an amazing step so there's two things i'll say here this is an amazing step i don't 
have a lot of hope that it would ever happen because I think that it's not going to come top down. I think it's going to come bottom up, which is again, this double-edged sort of social media. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen because hopefully we can educate people like this. I think it's going to come bottom up mm. a wellspring, like a grassroots effort. I just don't see it happening with legal uh, regulation from the top, but that would solve a lot of problems. And we can talk about this because I think there are a couple of fundamental changes in our food that have happened because I'm actually pretty good friends with, um, so RFK's vice president, her boyfriend slash partner is a good friend of mine from Costa Rica. And I was talking to them and they've been posting a lot, RFK and Nicole Shanahan, like we need to use AI to figure out what's causing chronic illness. And I said, like, kind of like respectfully, we don't need AI to figure this out. Yeah. This is not like big machine learning. You look at the human diet and there are a few fundamental things that have happened even in the last 200 years in our diet, a few changes that I think have caused a lot of issues. And if you just change, if you just undo those simple things, you fix a lot of things. And we can talk about that if you want. I mean, yeah, seed oil, are, I think so seed oils, oils are a big one. Um, and then the ultra processing of food, the removal of sugar from the food matrix. So this is an interesting thing that we can go down the rabbit hole. I think processed table sugar is very different than sugar in fruit, or fruit juice or honey. And that's interesting. So stripping sugar away is like a processing. So stripping sucrose, which is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose, pulling that out of a food matrix is, I think, bad for humans. And this is something you wouldn't expect, but the medical literature with fruit juice is very is very favorable. Fruit juice looks really good for humans. Is that something you always thought? No, definitely not. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a big change for me because that's just been humbling to, um, to think about things and then to learn more over time. And I get a lot of flack for that. I get a lot of shit for the ways that I've changed my mind over the years. But I think, and wait, so, but can we, can we simplify that? Cause I don't think I'm following. So if it's, you thought you think that sh like a diet Coke is essentially what you're saying, like where you're pulling out the sugar or diet Coke is or artificial sweeteners, yeah. right? So that's aspartame, ACE K sucralose. Okay. We can talk about those. Yeah. I'm talking about Coca-Cola now, regular Coca-Cola with sucrose Got or it. high fructose okay. corn okay. syrup, right? So sucrose is table sugar. Yep. Right. So you can get it. I don't, we don't get this anymore, but you can, you can buy like bags of table sugar. Maybe my mom used to buy bags of sugar to yeah, bake. Like with. dump it in the coffee. You, you dump it in the coffee yeah. or you use it to make a carrot cake or something you like can white bag. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's sugar. And that the removal of that from food is, appears to be harmful for humans for us. But what's interesting, the removal of that, so the, because the, it's real sugar then. Well, because no, because it's like, if you pull a sucrose molecule away from food, the human body has never really seen a pure molecule of sucrose without all the other information that comes in fruit. So I think this is interesting for people to understand that fruit looks very healthy for humans in the medical research. So you're saying that the artificial sugar is no, what's even bad. Artificial sugar I think is problematic, but also sucrose, also table sugar. Got it. Hey buddy. Hey. Wanna play a game? No. Oh, well we're gonna play anyway. All right. It's called Jake or Logan. Okay. Which, which brother is a better gifter? A gift giver. Me. Really? Yeah. I, I, I honestly, like, I'm the brother that lets people win a thousand times their money on better picks. That's a gift from heaven, honestly. How to Turn a dollar into a thousand. That's, Five dollars into five thousand. You can't how do, do I, math. How do I do that? The best fantasy sports app. All you got to do is download better, play better picks. And I could set an eight person lineup. And I could thousand X my money. Indeed, you can. The competition only has 300 X multipliers. So better picks is quite literally 3.33% better than 333% better than everyone. Damn. So you're the better brother at math too. <sighs> Probably the fucking got a C in geometry and shit. That's math, right? Geometry download better and play better picks. It is. I'll just talk about a quick study. So this is going to get a little technical, but I'll try not to make it too technical. So you can put sugar, well, you can put glucose directly into somebody's vein and raise their blood sugar. And if you do that, if you put glucose directly into the human body and raise somebody's blood sugar, you see the inside of your blood vessels start to get dysfunctional. We call it endothelial dysfunction. It's not terribly important technicality, but like your blood vessel lining becomes dysfunctional if you infuse glucose into the human body because you raise the blood sugar, right? But you can also raise the blood sugar by drinking fruit juice and the blood vessel response is not bad. It's, it's actually completely healthy when you drink a fruit juice and your blood sugar goes up, the endothelial function gets better. So there's so many studies with orange juice, watermelon juice, cherry juice, pomegranate juice, whatever. Endothelial function, the function of your blood vessels improves. So the point here that I'm making just high level, we don't have to get too bogged down, is just that when you ultra process foods and you remove all of the other information that our bodies are used to seeing with a fruit, you eat an apple, 
it has sugar in it, but it also has fiber, it has pectin, it has phytochemicals, right? You eat an orange, it has vitamin C plus sugar, and that responds, that responds in your body, your body responds very differently to that than it does to a molecule of sucrose. We can talk about the artificial sweeteners separately if you want, but no, like, that No, that makes sense. That makes sense. And yeah. then the seed oils are kind of the same way. So uh, if you, stop, you guys stop me if I'm getting too technical, but seed oils are things like soybean, canola, those are the main ones <clears throat> that are in our food, corn, safflower, sunflower. And what we're doing here is taking these seeds and like grinding them up and pressing them. There's actually this great video on YouTube of how they make canola oil. And it just looks gross because canola seeds are actually from a plant called a rapeseed plant. And they grind them up and you see this gum and all these waxes pouring out. And then in, from the oil, you have to use hexane, which is contaminated with benzene. And then you have to heat it and it's basically refined, it's bleached and it's deodorized. So we're taking a f something that could potentially be a food. Rape seeds are not something that humans would ever eat, but a sunflower seed a human might eat. And you're basically concentrating, you're pulling the oil out of that, you're concentrating it. In the process, you're damaging the oil and then you're giving humans uh, a product that they never would have had in their history. Mm. So a seed oil represents something that's kind of a damaged oil. That's a much higher concentration of that oil than we ever would have had historically. So you think about, I'll just say this and then I'll pause, like, corn oil or soybean oil is, well, corn oil is a good one. Corn oil is like a, is a, is a seed oil that people used to use. And in order to get the equivalent of five tablespoons of corn oil, which is the average American eats five tablespoons of seed oils per day. So soybean, canola, corn, peanut, whatever. To get five tablespoons of corn oil, you'd have to eat 70 ears of corn. So you would never get the, you know, yeah, that to get five tablespoons. There's, there's nothing natural about it. It's, like, it's completely, un, it's just, and there's information. This is what gets lost in medical school. We're never taught this. Food is complex and it's information. Like you can eat corn and be healthy. Some people eat corn and they don't digest it well, but you could probably eat corn and be healthy. You pull an oil out of corn and it's very problematic for humans. You can, some people, I mean, in, in Asian cultures, they eat soybeans and they're pretty healthy, you know, but you pull an oil out of soy and that's problematic for humans. So where, so what are the like most common foods that all of these things are found in at the grocery store? So obviously any chips, right? Potato chips, tortilla chips. Damn. They're in dressings, salad dressings. So the oil used in salad dressings is almost always a seed oil. They get baked into cookies. They get baked into crackers. Almost everything in the middle of the grocery store has some seed oil in it. And a small amount maybe is okay, but we are just now getting hugely uh, evolutionarily inappropriate amounts of these seed oils and they kind of accumulate in our bodies. And that's a problem. So, and then you think like, you know, I was talking to some of the guys in your crew and they were saying, I think a lot of people, and I used to do this when I was younger, you know, a lot of our diets come from fast food and we think there are healthier fast foods like Chipotle or Chick-fil-A, but you go into Chipotle and I just did a video about this. You ask them what oils they cook with and they're using canola, they're using rice bran, this is how it happens. We think Chipotle is healthy, but the chicken is cooked in seed oil. Yeah. The rice is cooked in seed oil. There's seed oils in the tortilla. And I'm not saying this to be a full downer. It's like knowledge is power. Know better, do better. We're, we're at whatever level you want to in your life. You know. I thought I was getting so swole eating Chipotle when Bro, I was in I high school. Ordered Chick Fil A. Do you have a question? Okay, Rizzo has a question. You say like kick the veggies, right? Like are vegetables actually bad for you or what do you mean by that? Yeah, so we can circle back to that one. I think that in humans that have autoimmune disease that they can't fix, it's probably worth cutting out vegetables for a short amount of time to see if that improves your autoimmune disease. That was my experience. I was eating a almost entirely organic diet when I had bad eczema. I was eating vegetables, I was eating salads, I was eating nuts, I was eating meat, I was eating eggs, uh, and I was eating fruit. And then I went to this kind of extreme place called a carnivore diet where I was just eating meat. And that was so interesting for me that I wanted to tell people about it. And I talked about it, I wrote a book about it, because I think that for some people who have autoimmune disease or gut issues that can't be fixed, they just tried all sorts of diets and stuff, elimination diets, eating a small amount of foods helps you understand what's triggering it. And the goal is always to add foods back in and have the most varied, interesting, fun diet you can. But for some of us, um, and I think this was kind of your story as well, foods that we think of traditionally as healthy can, can trigger the immune system. And maybe that's because I have a uniquely uh, irritated and uniquely sensitive immune system. I got over medicated as a kid, right? My parents are doctors. I got lots of antibiotics as a kid. Maybe I'm more sensitive than other people. I don't think everybody needs to kick vegetables, 
don't cook your vegetables in seed oils. <laughs> um, but I think that some people are uniquely sensitive. I'll give you an example from my history. Tomatoes are a fruit, but we think of them as a vegetable. And tomatoes, I'm Italian. My, my last name is Saladino, right? Tomatoes are delicious. Tomato sauce is so good. I made my own tomato paste in my house recently, and I haven't eaten tomatoes in a few years because they're one of these foods that you think of that traditionally kind of is an immune trigger for people. They're part of a family of plants called the nightshade family of plants. And my eczema came back so much. I had tomato paste that I'd made myself. I took the skin off, I took the seeds out, I boiled it, I like cooked it. I made my own tomato paste from organic tomatoes. And my eczema came back on my wrist within four days. It usually takes a little while because of the nature of eczema. And I thought, this is so interesting. And if you guys, you may not know this about me, but I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit intense about my diet. So I basically eat the same thing every day. So I'm pretty confident that this one thing that I changed is triggering it. I don't think tomatoes are bad for you, you know, but maybe tomatoes would I trigger like your tomatoes. eczema, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like, this is what's interesting to me. And this is the main thing that I learned from a carnivore diet. And I don't want to discount how valuable that is for people and how many people have been helped by this with carnivore is that some, a lot of foods we think of as healthy can trigger some people's autoimmune conditions. But if you're thriving, like don't change anything about your diet, just keep kicking ass. And, but, but this is why I do the content because a lot of people never find out, never hear this. They never hear someone say, oh, you have irritable bowel syndrome or you have you know, IBS or whatever. Like maybe kale is causing that. And that's mm -hmm. interesting because no doctor's ever gonna tell you that kale is bad for you. But I just was hanging out with a guy today in Muscle Beach doing calisthenics. And he was saying, man, my gut got so much better when I stopped kale. And that's interesting, right? Not everybody does well with these things. Yeah. So that's, no, that's what you wild. gotta figure out, like that's, what works. No, that's wild. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the health benefit of vegetables is like aminos mostly. And you can supplement that essentially. Like think, you don't need to eat vegetables. Like I don't eat any vegetables and I like supplement it with aminos, not amino acids, but like it's like a super amino lutein or some shit. Yeah, there's, so this is interesting. I don't eat vegetables either. Um, I've tried to make my diet more varied and I just have found that for me, um, I eat in a way that I've just termed animal based now, which is like meat. But after carnivore, I expanded to eat some fruit and I eat uh, a little bit of raw dairy, like raw milk because I can find it. So basically I eat meat and fruit and raw milk. Um, and that works really well for me. So I don't eat vegetables either. And I don't think there's any nutrient deficiencies from not eating vegetables because if you just look at meat, just start with meat. So I was doing a carnivore diet for a year and a half. If you eat organs with meat, like liver and heart, which is hard for a lot of people, but there's ways to get it more easily. If you eat organs with your meat, you're getting so many nutrients. You're not getting vitamin C and you're not getting carbohydrates, but because you know ruminants, cows, eat grass, you're getting a lot of things that are in vegetables in the meat. People don't understand that a lot of the phytochemicals that we think of as beneficial in vegetables actually end up in meat. And if you eat a good meat, that's a grass fed meat, it has more of these chemicals in it that are probably beneficial. So lutein is a, is a pigment found in things like uh, red bell peppers and tomatoes. Yeah. That, that's actually in meat. Yeah. So I think that in terms of nutrients, um, if you add something like fruit to your meat, again, this is a very simplified diet that just works for me because I have an autoimmune condition. Um, then you're really not missing anything. So I don't think you're missing anything from vegetables right. as long as you're getting good quality meat, maybe adding some fruit in there for variety, maybe adding in some raw dairy, but people can also add some vegetables if they want to eat a sweet potato or something. People traditionally think of eating vegetables for two things, micronutrients, things like uh, vitamin A, vitamin E, right? Uh, and, and, and basically vitamins and minerals, B vitamins, magnesium, manganese, selenium. These are all found in meat in usually in higher quantities that are more bioavailable. And the flip side is also true. I'll just say this and then I'll pause. Uh, there are a lot of nutrients found in meat that are not found in plants. And that's an interesting imbalance for me that I think one of the other things that I try and emphasize in my content is don't fear meat because I think we get a lot of, um, uh, a lot of information or call, I hate the word misinformation, but I think we get a lot of misleading information from the news that is demonizing meat. And I think when you really look at the literature, it is such a powerful health food for humans, especially unprocessed meat. It's not like a piece of bologna, whatever, maybe not, but like a steak, hamburger, like a piece of chicken breast, so nutritious for humans. And there are so many nutrients found in meat that you cannot get in plants. And I can list them off, but it's just a arduous list. What do you, what do you think about strawberries? Strawberries are great. 
Because I saw, like, I think there's, like, a rumor going around that, like, strawberries are, like, not a real fruit and they're just, like, bad for you and so processed in America. And I'm not like worried that. about it. Okay. <laughs> I think strawberries are great, okay. man. Shout out to the strawberries. Shout out then. to the strawberries, yeah. So, this is BS with Jake Paul. I talk a lot of shit to people. <clears throat> What do you think about vegans? And don't hold back. <laughs> and don't hold back, please. So we have a vegan outside right now. There's this, <laughs> your brother box him up. <laughs> there's I've seen this great comment on my social media recently. They're like, this guy Paul has failed every diet he's ever tried, which I think is ironic. It's it's not true, but um, I appreciate the uh, the trolling people are doing. So I used to be a vegan, right? I experimented with a vegan diet about 15 years ago. Um, and a vegan diet for me, and I was a raw vegan, so I was trying so hard. I was going to the grocery store, buying two heads of kale a day, making smoothies. I had the worst gas. I couldn't even be in a room with you guys. Like I would be filling the cushions of this <laughs> seat with farts, and as soon as I got up, you guys would just be like, what the heck? So a vegan diet didn't work for me, and I think that the problem with, a, this is a vegan diet. I'm not talking about vegans. I'm talking about a vegan diet, is that it's deficient in so many nutrients, and I think people run into nutrient deficiencies. And if you want to avoid nutrient deficiencies on a vegan diet, you're gonna to have to have a PhD in nutrition and probably take 60 plus supplements a day. And even then I think you're gonna become nutrient deficient in things. I think vegans themselves are often really have the right idea, right? They wanna make an intentional change with their diet. Great, do that. Make it, think about your food. If you wanna try a vegan diet, do it. Just be honest with yourself about how it makes you feel. If you wanna to go to a game, brother, I have just the thing for you. You got a ticket? It's no, but you can get yourself tickets on GameTime.co. <laughs> yep, the yep. best the best ticketing platform there is. You get twenty dollars off your first purchase if you use the code Jake J A K E. They are the best platform with a hundred and ten percent price match guaranteed. Ooh. So, if you find a better price on a different ticketing platform, you go to GameTime. 110% of your money. Though. And they have wait. flash deals, zone deals. You can see where you're going to sit on the freaking site before you get there so you don't get ripped off and get some bad seats. I have bad news, though. The mm -hmm. next game is the day we're shooting a podcast. Well, they actually have a job loss protection. So if you go to a game and you get fired, which you will get fired if you go to a game, uh, <laughs> they'll actually refund you the price of their ticket. Really interesting concept they have going on there, but we love game time. You know we yeah. love game time. So um, I get a senior discount if I use code Jake? Uh, yes, you get a $20 off your first First time order. users, T and C's apply. apply. There we go. Use code Jake for $20 off. First time users, baby. T's and C's apply. I think that a vegan diet is not a healthy diet for humans. I know there are people listening to the podcast or in the social media space that feel great on a vegan diet. Awesome, do it. Um, there are aspects of veganism that I think are misleading. I think there's plenty of great ways to raise cattle that are good for the environment, that support the health of the ecosystems, that you know are carbon negative, that do not contribute to greenhouse gases, all that kind of stuff. So, and I think that it's important for us to understand at an ethical level that as humans, we exist on the planet as part of a cycle of life and death. And if you wanna raise cows and eat them, that means like in order for something to live, something else must die. That is the way of life. And I think that if we try to avoid that and we think I never wanna kill anything, we're just kind of out of touch with where we've come from as humans. I mean, even raising, even growing a garden, you have to kill things because you have to get pests out of your garden. It's just, it's this kind of false hierarchy of, of one life is more important than another. And I think that like, it's okay to, uh, you know, eat something that has died to nourish you. Just remember that there's a responsibility that comes with that to be a good human and to do good in the world with the nutrition that that gives you. And I think that getting nutrition from meat allows us to be better humans in the world. That's a great answer. You yeah. have a question? Yeah. Uh, what are your, what's your opinion on now that uh, meat is being grown in, in labs? Like recently our governor uh, signed a bill banning it. Meat growing in labs is the Lab question. What, is, what are your thoughts? I, I saw that Florida, shout out to Florida for banning lab grown meat. If you look at the, um, if you look at the sort of the carbon equivalents and like the environmental impact, lab-grown meat is, is way worse for the environment than regular meat. It doesn't contribute to any sort of uh, regeneration of the soil. It's a horrible idea for the environment. At a nutritional level, I think it's an absolute farce. There's there's no way that you're going to be able to completely recreate a piece of meat in a lab that's going to be healthy for humans. It's going to have the incredible biodiversity, the complexity. We know. These things I talked about earlier, Jake, what a cow eats affects what's in the meat. 
how can you recreate that level of complexity in a piece of 3D printed meat? You cannot create the complexity and the nutrition found in a piece of grass fed meat and a cow that's been on a field eating grass its whole life in a, in a 3D printed steak. I think it's a great way to create really weak, unhealthy humans, which is probably what everybody wants anyway. Do you have something? Because I have something. Yeah. How do we end up with such conflicting evidence? Because especially with nutrition, everybody's talking about studies that are backing what they believe is right. optimal diets. How do we end up with such conflicting evidence on both sides? A couple of things. So there's, this is a boring thing, but I'll try and get through it quickly. There's different types of studies in, in medicine, right? There's observational studies and there's interventional studies. And a lot of what we are told that's confusing is based on observational studies. Studies where there's no experiment done. It's just people given a survey and the researchers are looking prospectively or retrospectively and trying to make connections. They're trying to make correlations, but they cannot actually say that that's causal, right? You think of experiments when you were a kid. I'm gonna take baking soda, I'm gonna add vinegar to it, I get a volcano, cool. That's, that's the way it all should be, but a lot of these nutritional questions are so complicated that you can't always take 10,000 people, put them in a warehouse, never let them leave, feed them all the same thing, control the environment for 10 years and see what happens. Like we just don't, humans are not lab animals. And so it's very difficult to do nutritional studies on humans. So we end up using subpar studies or subpar quality studies to try and make guesses about this. And so you get confusing things. I'll give you an example. In a lot of, but not all, observational studies, eating meat is associated, key word, slash correlated with worse cardiovascular outcomes. But if you actually look at the interventional studies where humans are given meat in place of usually grain-based carbohydrates, they get healthier. Mm. They have less inflammation, the uh, insulin sensitivity, like markers of diabetes improve. And some observational studies find that eating meat is actually associated with better outcomes in humans. So this is the tricky part of medicine. And what you find here is that there's something called healthy and unhealthy user bias, confounding. Again, I told you it was boring, but the thing is that if you think about the average American or the population in the United States, who eats meat? It's people that are eating meat at McDonald's and Wendy's and Chick-fil-A. How many people do you see eating meat as an average who are just eating a steak with some strawberries on the side, right? right? Or just a steak. It's whenever you go to a barbecue, you never just eat a hamburger with no bun. You eat a hamburger with a bun, so you got a bread on there, you got mayonnaise on it, the mayonnaise has seed oils in it, you're eating a cookie and a brownie with it, and you're drinking a Coke or a beer. So the messenger got shot. Yes, so that eating meat is associated with having fun, yeah. and people eating having fun are eating junk food. So we can't, you can't tell from these studies that the meat is causing a problem. When you look more closely, it looks, it's pretty darn clear the meat is not causing a problem, and why would it be? I mean, we've been eating meat for 350,000 years of human evolution, this is not a harmful food for us. It's completely consistent with where we come from. It's just that we've become so smart in medicine, we've gotten kind of dumb. So a lot of people ask me, you know, what diet should I do? What is this? What what should I do? Like you're in shape, whatever. I don't do intermittent fasting, but uh, because I just have to perform like in the morning and at night, two a days, I can't not eat. You changed my life with that though. But But I always tell people like, yo, if you're gonna do one thing, only eat in an eight hour window. I think that if you're, what we know clearly is that if you're eating junk, eating less junk is good. Yeah. That's why I say it's so easy because yeah. you could just fix that eight hour window. Start there because A, that takes willpower. So just start there and then that can evolve into like cleaner eating. After that, that's when I did this. I started doing the 72 hour fast. Yeah, he did the 72 hour water I've fast. I ever experienced, that was hallucinating. Wow, <laughs> yeah. So I think this is what I'll say, that in order to lose weight, get healthier, humans have to do some sort of moderation and discipline. Yeah. You have to do it. If you just eat whatever you want, whenever you want, you're never gonna get healthier. I think there are, better ways to apply that discipline. And that's not my first choice of how to do it, but if you can apply some sort of discipline and moderation to your diet, whether it's putting it into a smaller window or fasting, that's great. My, I think the best way to do this, which is probably the hardest way mentally, is applying the discipline and moderation to the quality of the foods you eat. I think that food quality is king. And if someone is willing to increase the food quality, and that's pretty intuitive, you know, unprocessed meat and plant foods, no bullshit. You don't have to do as much fasting and intermittent fasting, but 
if, if it's very, that might be too hard a step for people because that's probably the hardest step is to improve food quality. It's easier for someone to eat the same foods in a smaller amount of time. And like you said, okay, awesome. Good first step, do something intentional, do something with discipline. But I think in the end, the best thing, the thing that I really hope that people will learn and the thing I try to communicate to them and teach people is improving food quality. That's how you really change your life long-term. And that means, you know, you get up in the morning, you eat eggs, you eat eggs with butter, you eat some fruit with it. You just, then you, for dinner, for lunch, you might have a steak or hamburger, whatever you can afford with some honey or some, you know, a sweet potato or some yogurt. It's just, it's good food. It's high quality food. It's unprocessed every single meal. The smallest amount of junk food possible. That I think serves you best in the long-term, but it's the hardest step. Yeah, yeah, no, I think the low carb diet is when I feel the best. Really? Just like. You feel the best, like afterwards? During. During it, I feel the worst. Because I think for training for you. I feel so you, alive, like when I start to cut weight and not too much weight, but like when I start to have to lose some weight and eat less carbs, essentially, I just feel so sharp and like my thoughts are so fast i'm i'm have so much energy everything about it i just feel really good i don't know what why that is but what kind of carbs are you cutting out mostly like just pasta and like <laughs> potatoes and like yeah that that type of stuff so i think there's different types of technically there's i think that different carbs carbs is a funny word right yeah because it can it entails fruit as well right yeah, yeah. yeah so, no so we we still keep the fruit in there but right. mostly like the heavy carbs if you will a lot of people this is interesting because i've heard joe rogan say this and i've talked to joe rogan about this carnivore diet and animal-based diet a lot like joe is an interesting character because he did really well on carnivore he's done carnivore a few times and he gets really shredded and he just eats meat but he says his workouts suffer and i think that if you cut technically speaking, carbohydrates in general too much, your workouts will suffer. So I think for athletic performance, you want carbohydrates. But I think what Joe has realized, because when he added fruit back to his diet, he texted me and he said, I feel the best, this is the best I've ever felt. Yeah, exactly. It's like meat and fruit is still pretty extreme, but it's like this interesting middle ground where you have no bullshit, exactly. but you're getting carbohydrates from healthy sources. Yeah. I think that pasta is interesting, right? It's a carbohydrate, technically people call it a carb, but for some reason, wheat, especially processed wheat in the United States, whether it's fortification with folic acid, whether it's glyphosate and other pesticides, it just causes people to feel sluggish. Yeah. So that's one of the things I think you should get rid of. I don't think you have to get rid, and I'm saying you as like people in general, not necessarily Jake Paul, um, because your training is unique, but I think that in general, if people get rid of grain-based carbohydrates, they're probably gonna feel a lot better, but you don't have to get rid of all carbohydrates technically. Sweet potato is probably fine. I think fruit is good. These things really help with athletic performance. Yeah, what what we would do, it's low carb, but all the carbs come right before a workout. Yeah. So that the workout doesn't suffer. And then the rest of the days or time is just like mostly protein or fruit or whatever it might be. But um, yeah, whenever I start to like slowly cut down that like two to three week phase where it's not like super intense cutting weight, I feel so good. I'm like happier, functioning better, like high energy, everything. Let me ask you a question. Why don't you eat like that all the time? I think there's no certain, no, I think there's, I think there's certain um, fights where like, I'm not supposed to lose, like I don't need to lose weight and I shouldn't lose weight uh, because I'm performing better. And the if the, if the winning the fight is the number one priority, then if like happiness and like being a higher energy, like come second or third, then I'm gonna eat to like gain weight, gain muscle, recover better. Right, right. Uh, because I, I will say in those times where there's less carbs, like recovery is not as good. Right. But this is like super high functioning to a day, like athletic performance. But in, in general life, when I'm done being an athlete, I will eat that way. I do think I'm a fat kid at heart, so like I fucking love food. So I do uh, cheat, if you will, and, and that's okay. And and I also, yeah, I don't I don't feel like it's in a way that is affecting me. But I think once I'm slightly older, I'll probably get into like a super good intermittent fasting and healthier cleaner i think it's a coin toss you're either going to be fat because you can eat whatever you want whenever you want 
Or you're gonna go down that route. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be. I'm basically gonna drink tequila and intermittent fast. Yeah, that's what's, good. That's good. What's Jake Paul gonna look like after his boxing career? I'll I'll probably be. So people think I do steroids and all this shit. So I have a plan. Uh, because I think it's fucking bizarre. That's like the only excuse they can come up with is like rigged fights. Jake Paul does steroids. So after boxing, I'm going to do a cycle of steroids to show people what Jake Paul on steroids actually looks like. Fair. Because I want to shut people the fuck up. But besides that, um, I will I'll probably just, yeah, intermittent fast and uh, eat as clean as I can in that window. But I also don't want... like. I don't want to not enjoy life. Like I love dinners and just ordering hella shit. So, and I think that's the balance for a lot of people. That's that's a pretty much exactly where Joe is. I think Joe Rogan's in the same place. He knows if he eats a certain way, he's gonna feel good, but he also wants to live his life, and that's fine. Yeah, that's exactly. And so this where is I'm at. this is what I was saying. And this is what I've I've evolved to this place. I think when I was younger and started doing the content, I was much more kind of intense and in people's faces. But I feel like if you're thriving and your quality of life is where you want it to be, keep doing that. You know what you can do. You know exactly how to turn the lever, the dial, exactly where you want it. And you can turn it however you want. That's your that's your right as a human. But what's interesting, I think, is that what I really want to communicate to people is that for people who have autoimmune disease or are suffering, I want them to understand like that's the time that you get really intense about it because then you can really heal yourself. And if you don't have those issues, man, get whatever you want. Yeah. No, I did have to go gluten-free for about six to eight months yeah. uh, because of my leaky gut. Yeah. And that and that was a big difference. But now that my gut is like fixed, I'm not. I do the food tests in the blood mm -hmm. probably like every six months just to see if I'm intolerant towards something. But after fixing that, um, yeah, I'm just like kind of turning the dial. Yeah, and a lot of times people can. This is the way it goes for people that you can do something like carnivore or animal based, which is again just meat and fruit basically, and then things kind of can get better over time and you can add back in foods that cause yeah. issues for you. You know, I was talking to a friend the other day on his podcast and that's what he was saying that he had to cut out coffee, which is like sacrilege for most people. And then after he was able to do that, after he cut these things out, he was able to eat foods that he could never eat in the past. And so I think that the gut can heal. Again, it's a, it's a difficult science to really put into a box and understand in, in its entirety, but I think it's powerful making intentional dietary choices and, I, there's so many people I know that are listening to this podcast that have either depression or, or obesity or insomnia or don't have the libido they want or they, you know, whatever. And like the quality of the food that you eat, that can change everything for people. That's, that's what's really valuable to me. For you in your personal life, as someone who has a relatively radical approach to yeah. their diet, is there room for you to stray a little bit off the straight and narrow at times? Is there is there a place for something like alcohol at all in your life? Is there a place for something like enjoying a cigar at all in your life? Is it, do you ever stray off the, the straight and narrow? You know, I think that we all have different like psychology yeah. and my psychology is not aligned, like doesn't work with that, you know? Like I, um, I don't drink alcohol. I've been drunk maybe five times in my whole life. I just wow. don't enjoy it. Yeah. I just don't like, and I don't like the way, it makes me, the way it makes me feel the next day. I either want to, I want, when I was in college, I wanted to study because I was a nerd in college. Now I want to get up and surf. I just, I love, I love the way it feels getting up in the morning surfing more than I like drinking alcohol. And I sort of learned for me personally, and this is not a judgment on anyone else, that it was just, it was kind of a fun challenge to talk to girls or to just be relaxed without the alcohol. And I think that when we, if you look at the research, I think we know pretty clearly alcohol is harmful for humans at almost any dose, it shrinks the neocortex, these layers of the brain, or this region of the brain and, and the, you know, parts of the brain. And it's not that it's gonna kill you and we're all gonna die eventually, I get it. It's just every person has to decide where's, what's the quality of life that they want. Mm -hmm. And for me, alcohol doesn't add to my quality of life. If it adds to someone else's quality of life, great, um, but it doesn't, doesn't add quality of life to me. I just don't have any real cigars around me. And I think that I'm just the type of person that, like I probably, so I think this is, like a, a little bit of a foil. It's like a weakness that I've tried to make into a strength. I think that I'm a little bit intense and I think that the intensity gives me discipline to do research and share these things and create a diet in my own life. I mean, anyone that knows me knows that I'm not one of these influencers, I hate that word, uh, you know, that like says something and does something different on the back end. Like I'm actually more intense off camera than I am on, there's a lot of things I do that I can't show people because they all just think I'm absolutely, you know, like intense, whether it's, the way I, you know, I don't use shampoo or soap or whatever, or, you know, traveling, like 
of course, I'm obviously telling people now, but you know, when I travel to an Airbnb, I bring the sheets for the bed because I don't want to sleep on polyester sheets. I'd rather sleep on cotton sheets, this kind of stuff. So I'm more intense off camera than I am on camera. But it, the good part there is that I can experiment with this for myself, do research in the medical literature and try and communicate to people what's worked for me, what's worked for people in the community and what I see in the literature. And that's, that's, that's the most meaningful thing for me. So I don't feel like I'm missing anything, but I know not everyone's wired kind of like I am. I'm a little bit, uh, I'm a little intense up there, but I try to leverage it for the good. And I try to, I also understand that like my friends want to go out to dinner. That's great. I'll go out with them. I want the socialization. I just know that I'm going to go to a restaurant that doesn't cook in seed oils or that cooks a steak. Because if I go to a restaurant that cooks a steak, eight out of 10 times, they're not putting any seed oils in the grill and I can just get a steak and I can kind of just, I'm not trying to make anybody else have to cater to me. I just want to like go hang out with my friends. I'm going to eat a steak. There's ways to do it. Um, for me, but I have to think about it and I kind of work around it. But that's also because that's the quality of life that I want. And that's just my choice. Yeah, it's like different, but I don't think everybody needs to live that way. Well, I think you should, I think you should talk about all the extreme shit. I think it's <laughs> cool as fuck. And I've also been getting more into the like bedding conversations with the, the sheets and all of that material because you're spending eight to 10 hours there a night and all these, I guess, chemicals are, are going into your fucking skin but yeah it's intense are you fucking serious no i'm being serious yeah yeah it's pretty intense i mean i, I just can't live yeah but that's 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 how most people feel and no, i don't because want it's i don't want to feel that way it's no, modern I, just, day. I just can't live bro i i was modern fucking day. drinking pl out of plastic water bottles then i find out yeah. i have fucking enough estrogen to beat five women <laughs> fucking i can't sleep on my bed anymore bro i quit <laughs> Shit's fucked up out here like what, what am i you gotta pay for water with fucking what am i supposed to it? do you just, I think you go, you just go as far as you want, right? Right now you're losing weight, you're intermittent fasting. That's, that's all you gotta do. You go as far as you want. It's your choice for your quality of life. Cause this is the thing, it gets overwhelming for people. It doesn't have to, you don't have to go all the way, right? You don't I'm have to go. I'm just gonna die. No, yeah, well, we're you all should. gonna die, you know? But. I don't like this. <laughs> Not me, I have quantum immortality. Yeah, 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 we, we, yeah. But right. that's for another conversation, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but so you don't use any soaps only water in the shower <laughs> it's so this is i don't um and it's not because i'm trying to be like liver king or anything i just i live in costa rica i'm in the ocean two plus hours a day and in costa rica it's hard for me to get a good soap right this is the problem with living in costa rica is i, I don't want a soap that has fragrances because these fragrances can be hormonal disruptors I'm 46 and I'm really proud of the fact that my testosterone is like 800. I don't do TRT and I want to keep it there, wow. right? A lot of your audience is not 46, but like I want- I, Just real quick, has your, has your test always been that high? Yeah, yeah. I think it's probably been higher in my life. Okay. But yeah, yeah. Okay, it's just, okay. Yeah, but I think that it's, I just intentional choices I think are what allow me to have a quality of life. Hey, you got a dollar? Fuck no. What, do you have a dollar? I think I got a dollar. Well, you can turn that into a thousand dollars on Better Picks. Wait, I have a dollar. I have a dollar. Yeah, now you want a dollar. Okay, you can turn that into a thousand, brother. It's ah. that easy. Better Picks, eight lineup picks, turn it into a thousand dollars. Someone last week turned a hundred into a hundred thousand. Better Picks has the highest multipliers out of any fantasy. I think I could available. hit an eight pick lineup. Yeah, probably, probably. People are doing it. You just gotta have me. some skill. I got skill. Download better, play better picks, thousand extra cash. The other thing I do is I don't use plastic cutting boards. So yep, yep. we stopped that too. Got got wooden cutting boards. Microplastics are a big deal, and it's just I it, stopped drinking water, plastic water bottles. Huge difference. This, they, they said you stopped too. Well, oh. I told, I taught him about this. So that I once I found out that if you drink plastic water bottles every day, then you're consuming a credit card's worth of plastic every week. Is what, is I think what, that statistics a little bit inflated, but well, there's something it. intense. It's there. one step at a time for me. Yeah. What is a reasonable solution to that though? Because glass bottled water is really, really expensive. So you can get a water filter in your house Common. or your apartment. Um, they, you know, if you, even if you, or renting an apartment, you can get a reverse osmosis filter on Amazon. They're not cheap. It's like $300, but it's it's something that you will have for years. And it doesn't have to plug into the sink. It's a countertop reverse osmosis unit. You can use sea salt to remineralize it, and then your water is great. And it gets everything out. Like, if you look at what's in Miami tap water, it's great, like pesticides, uh, hormones from birth control, uh, other pharmaceuticals, heavy metals, 
breakdown products of chlorine that are associated with cancers. Like you really don't want to drink tap water. You know, I think drinking bottled water is not sustainable because of the, the plastic you don't want, the glass is heavy. Just get a countertop filter and there's all sorts of options. It'll improve it. A Brit is not enough, um, I, I, ideally. I feel like I I've, spent, been, I've been being a human wrong my whole life. Yeah, you have. That's why I love this guy. Um, so I spent 180K to get a uh, super water filter. Not everybody needs to spend that much money. No, no, for the whole house, <laughs> well, that's though. That's amazing, though. So like the pool, hot oh, tub, showers, sinks, toilets, like everything. I, I don't know why. The, I guess the toilets are just Thor, the Thor drinks out of the yeah, toilets. Yeah, Thor, my dog does drink out of the toilets. He's lucky, he bro. won't stop. He's lucky. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, and I was like, this is the best money ever spent. Like, well, literally fucking humans are water. So it's like... Such an important thing. Yeah. But it, you can do that for... Granted, <clears throat> not cheap, $300, but that $300 investment will last you for years and years. You have to replace the filters every six months. Like, But you know how much do you spend a year on your cell phone? How much do you spend a year on Netflix? How much do you spend a year on these things? Like investing in your water quality is huge. I think the Netflix thing is is uh, like really worth it though, especially like on July 20th. <laughs> yes, yes. But sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah. <No. laughs> and I think that's, I mean, that's most of Great it. Plug. Obviously like... Uh, you know, so like I travel with a cutting board. I traveled to Miami with a cutting board because I knew that my Airbnb was only going to have plastic. So what boards. what else do you have when you travel like to to avoid things? I, so you would travel cotton sheets. Cotton sheets. Um, I mean, I, I pretty much only wear cotton clothing. So this is an, a crazy thing. Like it's only studies in dogs. Uh, we need to do these studies in humans, but they've done studies in dogs. This sounds crazy, but it's true. Where they put dogs in like polyester underwear, like dogs that are not you know fixed dogs with balls, they put them in polyester underwear and they see changes in the sperm. Oh, yes. Like more sperm? Less sperm and less motility in the sperm when they put polyester briefs on dogs for is a it, few months. Is it, a, is it a large decrease or is it? I couldn't, we'd have to find the study for you. It's significant. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that the thing is when they get rid of the polyester briefs on dogs, Is there a good reason returns. to have more sperm though? Well, you want, it's an indication of like, fertility and sperm quality right you want your sperm to be modal and these things so basically it's just the solution here is cotton or wool underwear i told you, you guys didn't want to know anyway so like it's just like again it's not meant to be overwhelming it's just meant to be like no better do whatever you want but just know what's affecting you as a human so you can make the changes that you want to make can we talk about some of the the common concerns relating to the diet aspect of things yeah, when yeah. you talk about like an all meat diet or meat animal based diet yeah, yeah i think some of the first concerns that would come up is like one something like cholesterol two something like am i going to smell and be greasy all day yeah uh what, how, how do these things work out on a diet like that I don't think you smell and I don't th I think most people who do these diets smell less and they're not greasy. Their skin gets better Can usually. I smell you? Yeah, I mean this this wool shirt's been on for a while, you know, but no, you smell normal. It smells like a normal like guy. A human and being. I actually yeah. like worked out. I was like in Muscle Beach in this wool shirt today. I probably smell better than Liver King. Dang. I love you, bro. Yeah, I love you, yeah, Brian. Yeah, no, no, he he definitely has got a stench going in person. <laughs> I love you, Brian. <laughs> I love you. But Luke. why is that? How come? It, how come you don't? Are you using a natural deodorant? No, I don't even have any natural deodorant on today. It's just. But how come he's stenching? I think he's just. He usually doesn't even wear shirts, you know. Like, but the the other pack that I found is like wool shirts. I mean, forty bucks on Amazon. Like, it doesn't smell as much as a cotton shirt smells. So I definitely think you're not going to smell like meat. Your skin's probably going to get better because you're cutting out bullshit. The cholesterol one we should talk about because this cholesterol is good. We should talk about M this. Bro math. <laughs> Am it's, I wrong, right? Bro, man. Maybe I'm wrong. I'll shut the fuck up. <laughs> it's tricky though. Okay, so like, I'm going to try to do cholesterol without getting too technical. So cholesterol is really referring to LDL cholesterol, right? The bad cholesterol, but it's not bad cholesterol. LDL cholesterol has critical functions in the human body. It, See, it's, I was involved, right. it's involved in your immune system. It's involved in, in transport of materials throughout the body. It moves things around your body that are precursors for hormones. If you block the production of cholesterol, which is actually a steroid molecule that goes into cell membranes, that, that's a precursor for hormones in your body. And it, it, the downstream uh, sort of effects of blocking cholesterol are tons in the human body that are bad. Like this is what statins do. It's a drug that blocks cholesterol. And we say it lowers cholesterol because if you block the production of this steroid molecule cholesterol, you get less LDL cholesterol. LDL is like a boat. It's a it's like a balloon full of cholesterol and triglycerides. Triglycerides are essentially fat. So LDL cholesterol is a balloon that floats around your bloodstream full of cholesterol, steroid molecule, and fat. When you eat less seed oils, 
less polyunsaturated fats and seed oils, and more saturated fats from animals, in about 60% of the population, your LDL cholesterol goes up, about 20 to 30%. Mm. Now, doctors get worried about this because within Western medicine, we have as canon, as absolute dogma, that elevated LDL equals increased cardiovascular disease risk. And this is something that is technical to debate, but I think that there's lots of conflicting evidence. And I do not think that every elevation of LDL cholesterol carries the same increase in heart attack risk. And I think that in the setting of someone who is metabolically healthy, it is difficult to argue that an increased cholesterol carries the same risk of heart attack increase that, a, that an increased cholesterol does in someone that's diabetic. Unfortunately, most of the people we deal with in Western medicine are diabetic or pre-diabetic, right? You said you were pre-diabetic, yeah. you know? And so most of the population we see are sick. And so of course, in a sick population, LDL going up can increase your cardiovascular disease risk. But I think that when you are cutting out seed oils and increasing saturated fats, your LDL cholesterol going up does not carry the same increase in cardiovascular risk that it does in other situations. And so if you go to a doctor and you do this diet and your LDL goes up, they're gonna wanna put you on a statin, but you should ask them for a fasting insulin because you'll probably be more insulin sensitive. You can ask them for other tests to look at the actual plaque in your arteries. But I think that the conversation is complex. At a high level, I'll just say that I do not believe that every time LDL goes up, it represents the same increase in heart attack risk. And if someone has a baseline metabolic health, that's fine. What you're doing is healthy. You're getting rid of seed oils, which we know increase the propensity of LDL to oxidize. So this is one other just offshoot that I'll talk about and then I'll pause and let you ask more questions. So your LDL cholesterol can become oxidized. It's a balloon full of cholesterol and fat. And when that becomes oxidized, the proteins on the surface of the LDL become misfolded and it becomes more likely to be, to be incorporated into, heart, into plaques in your arteries. So oxidation of LDL is a very bad thing. And we know very clearly that seed oils will lower your LDL, but they will increase the rate of oxidation of LDL. And so lowering your LDL looks good on the surface, but there are many randomized controlled trials in humans showing that despite lowering the LDL, seed oils do not lower cardiovascular disease risk. And there's some that suggest they increase it. And they, we know very clearly they increase the oxidation of LDL. You eat more saturated fat, your LDL might go up, but your oxidation of LDL goes down. And again, we get back to this issue, does LDL cholesterol cause heart disease? And I think that it's just based around this sort of linguistic gymnastics around the word, what does cause mean? I think there's no good evidence that LDL cholesterol initiates atheromatous plaque in the coronary arteries. It's involved in the process, yes, but it doesn't initiate the process. And so we have to imagine and remember that LDL cholesterol has very valuable roles in the human body, immune system. And if you lower it with a drug, are you actually going to live longer? You, you can lower it with a drug and decrease your risk of heart attack, but your risk of other things actually goes up a lot of times. And again, I know I'm getting really technical. All cause mortality is, is, is not always improved, does not necessarily improve when you lower LDL cholesterol um, because other things get worse, cancers or immune or other problems can get worse because LDL cholesterol is valuable. So again, just high level blanket, you can forget everything I just said if it's too technical. I think there is good evidence that not every elevation of LDL cholesterol increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. And I think that that's, that's a very contentious issue that gets very technical very fast. How else can I make that more clear? Does that make any sense? Makes a ton of sense. <laughs> it's like, I look at it just yeah. for the, um, he, he, you might have blow, no, blown that, his brain up. Uh, yeah, but basically that was for the, the longest no I've ever heard. <laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> That's good. He what blew you, his brain what, up. What no, but he, basically what he's saying is, is that in no. a car, you can't just increase the engine size because you could snap a fucking axle there's too much horsepower going through the fucking transmission See, and now shit. we're fucking talking that's fucking what i said ohio shit um what do you eat every day so basically i eat meat i eat a little bit of liver a little bit of heart some organs i'll eat fruit i'll have some fruit juice i have raw dairy which is like either yogurt or kefir or raw milk oh see it when you said raw dairy i thought you meant like straight out the titty this well whole i would time. i mean you know <laughs> hey! So I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm gonna start eating whatever you eat every day because you have a great brain and mine is melting right now. Uh, well, I, I didn't. Uh, yeah. So like you know, I'll probably because you did cocaine last night. It's a disappointed no, Paul right there. You want me to take you through real quick what I eat in a day? What I ate today? Is that yes. Gonna be? Okay. Yes, yes. So first thing I do when I get up in the morning, I have raw kefir with honey. I, I like raw. I like dairy and honey in the morning. Again, I'm active, right? 
not everybody needs as many carbohydrates as me. Then I had, um, I had some fruit, I had some strawberries, I had some blueberries. I threw two burgers on the grill and I had burgers for breakfast. Then I went out to Muscle Beach. I did some uh, workouts with this guy. I did a muscle up, and I, I was I didn't I, was, I haven't done muscle ups in the past, so I got my first muscle up. Then I went back to my house and I had uh, I made some I got some like fresh squeezed orange juice. I ate some blueberries, made a little bit more steak, cut up some steak, uh, had a little more kefir with honey, and had like uh, a little sweet potato and maybe a little avocado. That's what I've eaten today so far. What's kefir? Kefir is fermented milk. It's oh, like a, man. yeah, you might not like it. It's kind of sour. Was, Just think like yogurt. Nah. Yeah. It's kind of like. This was great though. This bag is empty. That's good. It's good stuff though, right? Killed I've been it. eating it all podcast. <laughs> so you normally like, don't eat on podcast. Do you add these into your diet? Yeah, for snacks. When I'm traveling, so I'm just, I'm, I think that it's cool to build companies and create things that don't exist in the space. Yeah. And I think eating healthfully in a convenient way is hard. So it feels good to like create a business around foods that are super intentionally created. And those are just grass fed beef, a little bit of liver and heart. I don't know, can you taste liver or heart in there? Can you no, taste, no. You can't even taste the organs. No, it tastes good as shit. And like sea salt, vinegar and collagen casing. That's every, that's, there's no lactic acid. There's no celery powder. There's no preservatives. It's just a super good, and they're sourced from like this amazing, these amazing farms in Australia with like the happiest cows you've ever seen. Really proud of it. Do they give those cows beer? Uh, no, those are the those are the, <laughs> those wagyu. Are the wagyu yeah, cows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I went to these farms in Australia to see where we sourced the beef from, and they're literally like it's million dollar real estate on the south. I mean, there's nothing there, so it's not million dollar. But the farm is the most beautiful farm I've ever seen. Over, it's like the cows can see the ocean. They have an ocean view. Wow. They're just grazing on green grass with this incredible cow. Cow. cows. Like, I want to be a wagyu cow <laughs> in my next life. So God, if you're listening, because they get beer every day, and they get rubbed down, and they with get beer. massaged yeah, every I think, I think fucking day, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I'm recovering. Well, I have one more question on the in relation to concerns. Yeah, 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 hit me. Um, so I was on carnivore for quite a while, and it was great for me. But while I was on this diet, it was so different than anything I'd ever done before that I was obviously concerned about it, and I was doing a lot of looking into things. Um, and one of the main concerns I had was. Liver King being a big spokesperson for this diet, I came across his, I think it was his TikTok, and some of his breathing patterns were alarming. And then more recently, I saw a video from you, and it, I don't know if you had just got done with a workout or something, or if it was something, but I, I saw like your breathing didn't seem right. And that for me was, I was like, is this in relation to the diet? I don't know, maybe if you know the video I'm talking about. No. But, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any correlation with any of those things, but I, it's something Maybe that I noticed. Maybe you and I are just super excited and we like breathe deep. I mean, does my breathing seem normal? You can answer honestly. Does my breathing no, yeah, seem, seem, yeah, seem normal. normal today? Am I breathing okay today? No, yeah. So, yeah. Anecdotally, that was like one yeah. of the concerns I had because I, I saw it with Liver King and now we know that could be a myriad of could things. Could be a lot him, of but, things, yeah. Um, I did notice in one of the videos that you, you seem short of breath and that was like, yeah. for me, it was like, I, I wonder what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, people can look at what I do in the gym and see that I'm not really short of breath. Like I'm surfing like three hours a day. So I, I guess yeah. a different way to frame that yeah. question would be, do you have any medical ailments in your life right now? No. Cool. No. And I think that, uh, I mean, I feel really good surfing. You know, I go out, I surf for hours a day and then, you know, I was hitting the punching bags downstairs a little bit. I dabble with that stuff. And then what else do I do for workouts? Like basically calisthenics type stuff. I was in Muscle Beach today, working out, doing muscle ups and stuff. And then what else? Um, kind of just like movement stuff. But I feel like my exercise capacity is pretty good and my endurance is good. I mean, I keep up with my friends who are 20 years younger than me in the ocean. So I feel good about that. But I think that like, basically, like I described, my diet is basically meat and fruit, some dairy, some honey, it's 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 not that crazy a diet anymore that I eat. Um, yeah, sounds just like good. Like I, it sounds like I could. Well, do how funny no is discipline. it too? Is that that it is considered a radical diet? Is like returning to what's natural. What's what's yeah meant for us is considered radical. And something else you said earlier that that is funny and it's actually kind of sad is that you were talking about how you were a proponent of a more of a more strict carnivore diet, and then through research you decided to incorporate fruits a bit more and because of that people were giving you a hard time online and how funny of a thing is it that when you are willing to improve and willing to be wrong and willing to get better that people look down upon that i think it's just uh i don't know i think people like to hate on social media and it gives them an outlet they're kind of sad or unhappy and they see this like they want to hate on somebody or they want to dogpile on somebody who's getting criticized but i think also people 
they don't like the fact that I was excited about a diet, like a carnivore diet, and then changed my mind. They say, well, what are you gonna change your mind about next? Mm. I see that in the comments sometimes. You're gonna, next year you're gonna say red meat is bad for you. And I think like it's a good thing. I'm, I don't feel bad about it at all. I feel like it's better to be honest with people and open and humble and say, look, I'm learning. Well, I mean, isn't that what you want from a leader? I, Cause yeah. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think if there were a world where you were to come to the conviction that red meat is bad, that you would be transparent I would talk about, about it. Yeah, yeah and, would, and that's what you want from people giving yeah. you information is. Yeah, and I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor. I went to medical school, but I don't know everything. And mm -hmm. I'm still learning and I love respectful debates. And I think we need more of that. There's so much different ideas in the health space. And I need to have, I would love to have more respectful debates. I think the problem with social media is it divides us as humans. Mm -hmm. And so the debates become, they become bitter and, and vitriolic and they're not respectful human debates. But I think that sharing ideas is great. And I'm open to that and I welcome it. And I think that I've learned a lot over the years and I've always just tried to be authentic and share it. I think the other thing that people have a problem with is I wrote a book, you know, I wrote a book about the carnivore diet. And I think the idea of books is maybe a little bit of an anachronism. It's just, it's antiquated. Like you write your ideas in, on pages and they get frozen in time. Like that doesn't make any sense. It's just, your ideas are always evolving. And I, I wanna write another book now and I've actually kind of started and I'm a little bit scared to because I think, you know, you think about, I'm not writing fiction, I'm writing nonfiction science. Like. Of course my ideas are gonna change over time and I think people just need to understand that. Like I said in the beginning of the podcast, there are so many good things about a carnivore diet that I experienced. It helped me understand what was triggering my eczema. So I was super grateful for that and it was just part of my journey. It was like, oh, I went off on this exit or this, this path and I realized, oh, I went a little too far, tried to come back to the middle because I, I didn't really talk about this earlier in the podcast, but I realized after a year and a half of eating just meat that I wasn't gonna do well from like a, an exercise performance or a sleep performance perspective without carbohydrates. I just had like cramps and electrolyte issues without carbohydrates. So adding those back with fruit, a little bit of honey and some raw dairy really helped me kind of find what works for me now. And I'm always trying to add foods in an experiment, but that process of just navigating that I think is so interesting. And I don't think people need to mimic my experience, but I do think that this idea of food quality and the food choices you make being the single greatest determinant of your overall health, people need to know that. It's not just about calories, it's about food quality. And I learned that with carnivore. I learned like, hey, when I cut all the, all the plant foods out, my eczema gets better, but I didn't need to go that far. I can come back to the middle a little bit and find what works in the best way. But I still think the idea of carnivore is valuable. That elimination diets are so valuable, especially for people with issues that are not getting fixed. That's, that's what I learned from carnivore. And I'm proud, I'm proud of that, you know? And I think it's good. It's been a real learning experience for me to be humble and just try to be authentic about the journey. Fuck yeah. I think... Uh... I think people at home should follow you on social media and just like stay up to date with your new ideas and shit like that. And <laughs> next week, and, when I and anything that yeah, changes. no, and just, no, any any all your advice and like all the cool things and sorry, there's stuff on me, and all the all the new things that you're learning and stuff. It's been super helpful for me as well. And it's been helpful. And uh, yeah, we appreciate you coming on BS today. It's been an amazing conversation. Yes.